Let's pray. Father God, my Father in heaven, Lord, I'm here to do your will. So Father, calm me, move me aside, and let your Holy Spirit have full reign, Father, this morning. Amen. Speak to your people, Father. Speak to me that we may hear only your voice and help us to take it according to your will. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you look in your bulletins, I entitled the sermon Secret Agents. And if you define an agent, an agent is, is one who is authorized to act or for or in the place of somebody else. Like an emissary or an official in a government, for, for the government. And it also means one who engages in undercover activities, like espionage. Simply put, a spy or a secret agent. Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 1. No, chapter, chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 1. And I'm going to show you the first secret agent. Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Are you there? Amen. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. And here's what the Bible says. I'm going to pause for a minute. And I'm going to just say this. You know what amazes me? That... When I was young, we went to concerts, and everybody was striving to get in the front. Y'all don't hear me. Because we wanted to be close to the music. But when you come to church, everybody's sitting in the back. Don't be afraid of the Holy Ghost. That was a commercial. Gen Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. And the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Pause. God never told her that she wasn't supposed to touch it. Amen. Amen. God said you are not to eat of the tree. Amen? Amen. So she added something to God's word. Verse 5. For God doesn't know, it says in the, verse 4, and the, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not, what? Surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eye, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, pause again, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The verse ends with, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now let's get some insight from the spirit of prophecy. This is uh, taken from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 55. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 55. The serpent plucked the fruit of the forbidden tree, and placed it in the hands of the half-reluctant Eve. Then he reminded her of her own words. He reminded her of what? Her own words that God has forbidden them to touch it, lest they die. She would receive no more harm from eating of the fruit, he declared, than from touching it. You see what her half-truth did? She added that we're not supposed to touch it, least we die. And the enemy used that to his advantage. Are we there? Oh, it's going to get good in a minute. Perceiving no evil results from what she had done, Eve grew bolder when she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. It was grateful to the taste, 
And as she ate, she seemed to feel a vivifying power and imagine herself entering upon a higher state of an existence. It was just her imagination. Did you hear what I said? You know, there was a song back in the day. And this guy was talking about he was marrying this woman. They have a picket fence. And then finally, after he got through all this wonderful thing that he was having with this woman, he said, she don't even know me. It was just my imagination. She goes on to say, without a fear, she plucked and ate. And now, get this, and now, having herself transgressed, she became the agent of Satan in working the ruin of her husband. In a state of strange, unnatural excitement, with her hand filled with forbidden fruit, she sought his presence and related all that had occurred. The enemy used Eve to deceive her husband. Oh, I need you to get that. That was his wife. For those of you who are not married, wives and husbands know each other better than anybody else. Come on now. Come on, married folk. Y'all know what I'm talking about. They know your bad traits and your good ones. They know when you're having a conversation with somebody and you're lying because they know you. Come on now. And the enemy used his wife to deceive him. See, I want you to understand that Satan uses men and women as his agents to solicit to sin and to make it attractive. You know, a person who knows you and somebody you know can make something bad seem good. In 2 Corinthians, in our scripture reading, it says that we ought not marvel that Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light and that he uses us, I'm paraphrasing, and uses us as agents with an appearance of light. He uses us to win people on his side. And see, Satan is a great enemy of God, but unfortunately, he's a friend to some of us. In the scripture, he is called a destroyer, an accuser of the brethren, a deceiver, a liar, a tormentor, and finally a murderer. And oftentimes we as individuals, as church members, as people of God, reflect these same characteristics. Oh yes, we are accusers of the brethren. Accusing them night and day of stuff that they didn't even do. And yes, we're even murderers. Come on now. You know, you don't have to get a knife and kill somebody to be a murderer. If you've destroyed their character, you've murdered them. You see, there are tormentors above, um, among us. Come on now. Y'all know some of them. They torment you every time you see them. We are being used by the enemy, and some of us don't even know it. You see, Eve thought she was doing her husband a favor. So he can feel the same euphoria that she imagined she felt. Satan has many individuals in his employment. But he is most successful when he can use professed Christians for his satanic work. And get this, the greater your influence, the more elevated your position, the more knowledge you have of God's word, the better in his service. He is more successful with those who know God's word and do it not than those who don't know God's word. Your circle of influence is what the devil measures as he uses you to his glory. 
In James chapter 1, beginning with verse 14, the Bible says this. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So whoever entices you to sin is an agent of the enemy. Amen. Come on now. We talk people in the, oh man, I seen this movie, it was so good, you need to watch it. Come on now. See, we have been so deceived by the enemy that we don't even know we're being used by him. Do you know the Bible tells us that we are a holy nation? Matter of fact, the Bible starts off by saying we are a chosen generation. And then it says we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And this peculiarity, this, this sense of being different, which, this is what sets us apart from any other denomination. That's true. And yet, because we are who we are, the enemy uses us. And when the enemy uses us, those in the world, those who are outside to whom we are supposed to reach, will look at us and say, look at them, they are Seventh-day Adventists. They go to church on Saturday, but they're just like us. Yep. That, to me, is a scathing rebuke of us as Seventh-day Adventists. Yep. Because how are you going to call somebody out when they think you're in with them? And that stigma should stick with those who are sad Venice. Did you hear what I said? Yep. It should stick with them. Because they are not representing who we are. But what it does is that stigma, when they see one person who claims to be a Seventh-day Adventist, it goes over the whole yeah. of Seventh-day Adventists. So that when you say you're a Seventh-day Adventist and they had experience with one of the, the enemy's agents, they think you are just like them. Let me say this. It would be better. If those of us who are sitting here who are nominal Adventists, that's Adventists in name only, would not join the church until we are converted, then to claim to be a part of the church and being used by the enemy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6, the Bible says that this type, this sort, are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. See, many souls are being destroyed with satanic sophistry. And, 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 and many of his sitting here may be deceived even now. We believe that Adventism is one way when it's not that way. And God only knows how many of us are in that situation right now. And, 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 and those who are agents, we need to rebuke them. We need to reprove them immediately. We need to set them aside and let them know you do not represent us as a church. Unfortunately, we fear because we don't want to lose them. Can I say something? Don't get mad. But sometimes it might be good for somebody to leave the church so they can come back right than to stay in the church and influence other people to wrong. There are some here who will tell you, oh, it's all right to do that. I do it all the time. Oh, that, don't worry about that. That's not, that's not applied to us. All God's word applied to us. Amen. Every aspect. There is nothing in God's word that we can step away from and be safe. Saints of God, a mere profession of godliness is not enough. We must surrender ourselves to God. If you don't surrender yourself to God, then the enemy has a way to get at you. And it amazes me because the devil, he is like, he is like when you watch those things where, where people have something over somebody so they keep doing stuff that's wrong because they may be exposed. Oh, Y'all don't get me? 
There are some sins that nobody know but you. Say it again. There are some sins in your life that nobody knows but you and the devil. Because he was there when you did it. And every time you try to get right with God, he'll bring it up. Remember you did this? Yeah, you better keep doing what I say or I'll expose you. (laughs) It'll sink in. The greatest sins are bought by those who profess to be sanctified. The greatest sins are committed by those who are living worldly lives and claiming to be Christians. This class is sin. They're sinning all the time and they're using you to justify their sins because you said it's all right. There was a time. Please pray. There was a time when Seventh Day Adventists stood out amongst everybody else. You know, I'm going to say it. Seventh Day Adventists don't wear jewelry. I'll say it again. Seventh Day Adventists don't wear jewelry. Why? Because God said we're not to adorn ourselves with outward things. God wants to adorn uh, us to adorn ourselves with his spirit. In other words, it's an inward adornment. Amen. Amen. Come on now. Let me look. If you are blessed of God and the Holy Spirit is in you, you look better than anybody with Maybelline. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. Because there's a glow to you that is emanating from that spirit. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You ever seen a pregnant woman? Most pregnant women don't need makeup because they have a glow. Okay, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. (laughs) I was going to say something else, but I'm not. Listen, I'll say this. That when the spirit is in you, you don't look the same. Amen? So you don't need to adorn yourself because God has already done that for you. This is taken from the testimonies, the spirit of prophecy. It is in great mercy that God bears with their perversity and that they are not cut down as cucumbers to the ground, but still remains within the possibility of forgiveness. The forbearance of God is continually presumed upon and mercy abused. David, in his day, thought that men had exceeded the boundaries of long suffering of God and that he must interfere to vindicate his honor and restrain unrighteousness. Do you know we do that all the time? We think that we can help God out. God doesn't need our help. He does solicit our help. Amen. Amen. And he wanted on a volunteer basis. Amen. Amen. That means you're not forced to go. But those of us who are still playing church, those of us who are still outside the, 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 the safety net of God's wings. There's almost no hope for us. Because we know we're not in in safety, and yet we remain there. Why? Because we're comfortable in our carnalness. Our carnal natures feel better than the Holy Spirit's presence in our life. That's like an individual who continues to eat pork even though God said you shouldn't eat it. Because it appeals to their taste, and we don't understand, and we miss the fact that our taste buds are perverted, just like our eyes are perverted. Our mouths are perverted. Our ears are perverted. We need to be shown what we need to uh, taste and what we need to hear and what we need to see because we don't see it as sin until God tells us it's sin. Amen. Amen, Walls. When people are warned of the direction that they're going, it's often resisted. And when it's resisted, they begin to dislike the individual who's bringing the warning. And I say to you, if you want to dislike somebody, dislike the one who is who is bringing the warning and understand who you're disliking. Because if you dislike the warning, you're disliking God because God's voice is what's being heard. And then when we do that, we're pushing away. You ever heard the the term grieving the Holy Ghost? 
That's resisting the call of God. However, our persistence is because there are individuals in the church who are encouraging, encouraging us in sin. If you are caught up in something and a church member to whom you confide, confide said, it's all right, it'll get better. And te- instead of telling you to stop, leave it alone, leave him alone, leave her alone, leave it alone. Then you'd be encouraged in your sin. And you already know the word of God speaks against it, but it's OK for you. No, it's not OK for you. You know, the Bible says, enter ye in at the straight gate. Now, straight is not like a straight line. It's spelled S-T-R-A-I-T, straight. And it means strict, narrow. So when Jesus is talking, he says, enter ye in at the strict church. Our church needs to be more strict. And if our church was strict as it should be, these agents of, of agents of sin, agents of Satan will be exposed. Because we have no idea the damage that they're doing. You know, there are women who attend the church just to get a man. OK, I'll help. There are men who attend the church just to get a woman. Did that help? But there are some characters who have tried it over and over again, so much so that they're even going after married men in the church. And we allow them to continue in that sinful behavior. You know a scathing rebuke works? And with your rebuke, you have to, you have to stand by your rebuke, amen? Look, if you tell your child you're going to beat him, oh, let me, let me see. I live by the Bible. Amen. The Bible says you can beat them, they won't die. That means, that's not mean you take them out and and do damage to them. That means that you can spank that child. I don't care how old. Oh, you didn't hear me. I don't care how old. You spank that child, that child will get it. Amen. Some of them. But get this, get this. If you warn that you're going to spank that child and they never do it, you're doing more damage to that child. So when we rebuke somebody in the church, we, you know, we are so quick. Lord have mercy. Lord help us. You know, it used to be a time where it was difficult to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Y'all looking at me funny. It's not supposed to be easy, y'all. How many of you thought when you joined the Christian church that it was going to be easy? Y'all don't have to raise your hand. I know some of y'all did, right? You thought that when you came to church, you were going to be around these saints. And everybody was going to love one another and treat you so fine, right? And then you joined the church. But see, if you joined the church early and you wasn't ready, you wasn't prepared, you didn't go through the studies that you should have gone through, you didn't understand that the enemy is in the church as well as in the world, you wasn't prepared for what you seen. Amen. Amen. Because there are tares in amongst the wheat. And the Bible says they grow together. That means you might be sitting next to a tear. Unless you were prepared, it can run you out to church. That's what I mean by it used to be hard to get into church. You know, it used to be go through a Bible study for six, seven months. Oh, you didn't hear me. Right. Because you're supposed to count the costs. Did you hear what I said? You're supposed to count the costs because you have to give up self. Y'all know what giving up self is, right? I mean, let go of that stuff you think you love. Right. Your pork chops. Your makeup. Come on. Your jewelry. Certain clothes you need to burn. But when you hold on to those things, whether you know it or not, you thought you were coming to God. You thought you were giving yourself to God, but you were actually joining the church as an agent of the enemy. Because you were trying to justify your life. 
justify your lifestyle. Oh, I'm like this because my parents are like this. You ever heard somebody break out and say, well, I ain't giving up shrimp. No, I can't get that up. That means you can't give up self. Did you hear what I said? Well, I don't want to dress like that. That's so plain. You ought to be plain. Amen? Because your attention should, people's attention should not be on what you have on, but your character. Amen? Now, see, the devil is good at what he does because he makes us feel as if what we're doing is satisfying, it's appealing, and it fits into the Christian station. In other words, we look just like these other Christians, but we know our life is contrary. I used to know individuals who come to church and they fall asleep in church. And I used to wonder why, but then I started thinking about it. You know, Friday was a party night. Oh, you didn't hear me. That's when you went and partied on Friday. And there are individuals who are still doing that now in God's church. They go party and then they come out here on Sabbath. And they, they don't get excited about the music, even though the music is a blessing. Amen. The words are something to contemplate when you hear it coming from a, a voice that sounds like it's from heaven. Amen? Amen. But there's no hip hop in that voice. It's not what I was hearing all night. So it doesn't stimulate me. We need to be stimulated by the spirit of God. Amen. Amen. And not by some raucous beat. You know, when 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 I was considering this thing, I was like, Lord, is it is it is it only our churches? Is it only me that's going through these things that that are that are transpiring? It's only me that see this. No. It's happening everywhere because the enemy is thorough. He is good at what he does. And we have to be thorough. Amen. Amen. You know, we have to be careful who we place in certain positions. That includes me. You don't place me where I am just because you like me. Oh, look at that silence. Okay, you don't have to like me. (laughs) But, but the idea is that we are supposed to be looking at people's characters. Yeah. Right? Not, not how well they talk or what. There are some talented devils in, in the house. Did you hear what I said? Oh, yes. They're talented, but they're evil. Amen? We need to look at characters. Right? And, and, and their motive need to be to get closer to God. Amen? And saints, don't get upset with me. I'm just trying to share with you God's word. And God wants us to be different than everybody else. Because how could we share the love of God if we don't show the love of God? That's in every aspect of our lives. When we, when we dress and act a certain way, it's typically to bring attention to ourselves. And we, are, we ought to be taking the attention off of us and putting it on Jesus. Oh, I know it's hard because we like people to like us, right? Come on now. We like people to like us, right? We want folk to, to, to be on our page, to be on, our, 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 on one accord with us and what we think. This is why some of us, you know, when we're doing wrong, we look for somebody to agree with us. Y- y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. You hear something that you disagree with, so you go f- try to find somebody that agrees with you on that, that point. Mm-hmm. Right? You ask somebody, yeah, what do you think of this? And they say something, and it's like, no, I don't know. Okay, I'm done with you. <laughs> but then when you get somebody that agrees with you, then you got a long conversation for them, right? Listen, we need to measure everything by the word of God. Yeah. It, it is not in our opinion. It is not how we feel. Saints of God, please get away from your feelings. Because your feelings is not a good criteria. Our feelings are so... We don't even know, right? We can be happy one minute and crying the next. And some of us can cry and don't even know why we're crying. Because our feelings cannot be controlled. But the word of God is true. It doesn't change. There is no variableness. You don't have to guess. Listen, 
If you get somebody who tells you that there are gray areas in the Bible, they're lying to you. Did you hear what I said? They're lying to you. Oh, well, the Bible doesn't cover that. Oh, yes, it does. The Bible covers every aspect of our lives. Amen. Did you hear what I said? I said every aspect. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, for, for instruction in righteousness. We need those instructions, don't we? Yeah. But we cannot be instructed by those who are in the church who are not of God. Spirit of prophecy. It is this delusion which gives Satan's agents power. Listen to this. Should they come out boldly and make their advances openly, they would be repulsed without the moment's hesitation. But they work first to gain symp sympathy. And then they secure confidence in themselves as holy, self-sacrificing men of God. You get that? I'm going to pause just on that for a minute. You know, there are some people who always give the portrayal that they're holier than thou. Right? You go to talk to them and they go, how are you? <laughs> and you know that's not how they are. Come on now. And, and they give the appearance of holiness. And, and they gain your confidence, right? They, 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 they share stuff with you that sounds good. Right? It appeals to you. And then, once you gain that confidence, spirit of prophecy, as his special messengers, talking about Satan, they then begin their artful work of drawing away souls from the path of rectitude by attempting to make void the law of God. Amen. Now, when, it's, when the Bible talks about the law of God, it's every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. Yeah. Are you following me? So, so, so they'll say things and they'll, they'll, they'll make it seem like it's close to what the word says. I'm going to give you a for instance. A bishop should be the husband of one wife. Amen. Then you got people who say, no, 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 that's not what it says. See, in, the, in that day, you ever heard that one? Back in that day, you know, men were set up above women and so forth. But nowadays, last I checked, God said, I'm the same yesterday today and forever so what God said yesterday he means for today and he means for forever Amen. you know God he, he doesn't mince his word what God says he means yes. right. amen? amen there is a leadership principle that God has set forth throughout the Bible right. oh well there weren't women stepping up there were women in leadership I'll say it again <laughs> There were women in leadership. They were a part of the ministry of God. That's right. Amen? Amen. But there are certain things God said, no, this is only for men. That's right. But we have twisted the word of God and tried to make it gender neutral. You ever heard that word? Gender neutral? They got clothes that are gender neutral. neutral. Now, in other words, clothes for men and women. We need to be careful because we need to stick to the word of God and the word of God alone. Amen. And when the word of God says the husband, that, that takes women out. Amen. 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 Unless a woman can now be a husband. Or oh, let me be careful because they might make that a law. When they twist the word of God to fit into their realm, they're using these sympathetic appeals, sympathetic words to win us to that side. God loves everybody. Right? With God, there's neither Jew nor Greek, no male, no female. That doesn't apply to God's leadership principle. That's right. That applies to salvation. Amen? Amen? Because everybody God wants to save. Are you following me? We need to be careful to stick to God's word because there are, Satan has his agents even amongst our ministers. And we need to be careful because we listen to the minister in such a way that our minds are deluded and we no longer look at the word of God to check what the minister is saying. 
I say this all the time and I'm going to say it again. If you disagree with what I say, don't get mad at me. Pick up your word. Study it for yourself. Amen. Right? Amen. This is what the Bible says. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Amen. Right? And we ought to be workmen. In other words, put some work into it. Amen. Don't just read a, a, one text and say, see? No, read all of the texts for that subject so you can understand. But see, the agents of Satan do this. They take one scripture and they stretch it into things that doesn't even fit. See, it's the culture of man that's the problem. It's our carnal nature. We like things to go our way. And our level of belief is built on our carnal nature. See, we go as far as we can go without affecting what we want to believe, what we want to do, how we think. And, and that's something that we need to get away from as a people. Amen? It's amen anyway. I didn't expect a whole bunch of amens. By associating with dangerous elements, we become accustomed to it. So, so as we allow people around us who we know is living in sin, and yet we're, we say we're trying to win them to Jesus, but we're not telling them about their sin, we begin to take on their characteristics. Amen. You ever heard the saying, by beholding, you become changed? Amen. By beholding, you become changed. Whoever you hang around with, however long you hang around with that person, you'll become just like them. Even though you don't think you're like them, you become like them, and thus you are also been recru recruited to the enemy side. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of trying to help the devil with stuff. And if you look at your life, you should be tired of the enemy as well. Because here's what he does. He, he'll woo us into a spot and then he'll drop us and let us go. Yeah. Come on now. Right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. You ain't got to say amen to bring attention to yourself. But the devil will, will woo you into a situation and then he expose you. See what you're doing? And you claim to be a man or a woman of God. And once he gets something over your head, he uses it to his advantage. The Bible calls it strong delusions. That you will believe a lie. And, and you know we are deluded, right? Because the Bible talks about a man looking himself in the mirror and then when he goes away from the mirror, he forget what manner of person he is. You, you ever read that in the Bible? It, it, it's true, right? Because we all have a perception of how we look. Isn't that true? Uh, that is true, amen? amen? Okay, if you don't understand what I'm saying. Have you ever, somebody took a picture of you and you look at the picture and say, that's not me? Right? Yeah, that was you in the picture. But you had a different view of yourself. We need to estimate our relationship with God not by each other. We are not to estimate our relationship with God by each other. We are, are not to look at each other and say, oh, well, I'm better than him or I'm closer to God than him because we don't know. Amen. The one you think is in the worst position may be the closest to God. Amen. Because the Bible tells us for the, the, the more sins that God has forgiven from somebody, the more they gravitate towards God, right? For the love that he showed toward them. So we, if, when we run into individuals who are pretenders, those who are, who are faking, acting like they're Christians and far from it, those are the individuals we need to shun. Amen. You ever read in the Bible where it says perilous times shall come? Yeah. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bolsters, blasphemers, unthankful, unholy. You've read that before, right? Yes. And when the Bible is talking about these things, do you know that he's talking about the church? Amen. He, he's not talking about the world. We already know the world is messed up. Okay, some of us know the world is messed up, right? But God is talking about his church. Why? Because he wants to let us know that we got stuff to deal with here in God's church. Amen. 
Now you ask the question, Elder, why are you telling us all this? Why are you, why are you telling us that we may be agents of Satan? Why are you telling us all these bad things? Well, I'll tell you. Second Peter. <laughs> Second Peter. Chapter 2. I'm, I'm going to read from verse 12 to 15. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the day, time, spots they are, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceiving, deceivings while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. And hearts, they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Scrolling down is verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are lured through the lust of the flesh, through the, their much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Those which are clean escape from those which are in error. In this age of corruption, in this age of, of darkness, the adversary, the enemy, the, like a roaring lion, is placing people in our midst to cause us to turn away from God. And there's a necessity in, 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 in the voice of, of, of the enemy. The Bible says he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he, he may devour. Amen. Right? He's like a roaring lion. That means that he is out to get us and he's using people to get us too. So if you're being used by the enemy, you need to get out of the enemy's camp. Amen? Amen. You need to understand that once you've been in there so long, it's very difficult for you to let go. That's true. It's like an addiction. Did you hear what I said? Amen. It's like an addiction. You know, most addictions, well, most addictions, makes, gives you a, a euphoric feeling. You feel good. When you take the first hit. But you never find that euphoria again. That's right. Did you hear what I said? So all the other time you're seeking for it. This is what the enemy does to us. And he does, us, does, does it to us spiritually. He does it to us emotionally. Listen, as, as saints of God, we need to have a stronger constitution. We need to be not so easily um, hurt. We shouldn't wear our, our, our emotions on our sleeves That's right. because difficult times is here. When the Bible says dangerous times has come, perilous times, dangerous times, you never thought it'd be dangerous to come to church, did you? The idea of coming to church is not so that you can get a little word and go home. No, no, no. You got to prepare to come to church. Did you know that? Amen. Oh, yeah. Because you ought to come for a blessing and to be a blessing. Amen. Okay, I'll say it again. You're coming for a blessing and to be a blessing. Amen. It's, it's a selfless act. Yes. But oftentimes we come to church for points. <laughs> yeah, we think that every time we come to church, God says, okay, he was there today. It doesn't work like that. Right? Because this is a place where God is trying to save people. Amen? <laughs> uh, this is from the testimonies. Though a professed follower of Christ, he is Satan in the form of man. He has borrowed the livery of heaven that he may the better serve his master. Talking about the enemy. You should not for one moment give place to an impure covert suggestion or even this will stain the soul as impure water defi uh, defiles the channel through which it passes listen what she's saying is this and it happens often if somebody in church starts to talk negative to you you ought to 
push them away. Amen. Don't listen to them no more. Walk away. Okay, come on now. I know it's in us. We want to hear everything they're saying, especially if it's about somebody. But when a church member comes and says, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? You don't want to hear no more. You need to walk away. Because whether you know it or not, whatever they tell you is going to stick to you. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. Oh, I, I caught, cause so-and-so was caught doing this and that. The whole church doesn't know, but I'm just telling you in confidence. <laughs> Ain't that how we do? Come on now, and most of us try to pick the person who we know going to tell somebody else. Right? So it can go all over the church. But, but once that thing comes in your mind, even if, even if you're a child of God and you work, that thing will work on you. It will not leave you. It'll stick in your mind. Every time you see that person, it'll come to your mind. We're not to listen to that foolishness. Amen. We need to shun them. We need to push them away. We need to choose to follow God and God alone. That's right. Now, let me encourage you. <laughs> the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, Amen. but that all should come to repentance. Just because you've been used by Satan before don't mean you have to continue to be used by him. You can drop him right now. Because wherever God is, Satan cannot be. Whatever, wherever light dwells, darkness has to flee. So we as Christians, we as individuals, we have to daily, moment by moment, ask for the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Because if the Holy Ghost is in you, the devil cannot come near you. That's right. You ever word, read that scripture where it told you if, if God is in you, if Jesus is in you, you cannot sin? You ever read that scripture? Look it up. It's there, trust me. Cannot sin. The Bible says you cannot sin. You know, and it makes sense because Jesus never sinned. So if Jesus is in you, if the Holy Ghost is running your life, how could you sin? Amen. Now, are you following me? Amen. You cannot sin. You said, oh, man, it's hard to stop doing that. Yes, it's hard to stop on your own. You can't stop doing anything on your own. Now, many of you know this, but I like to use this as an illustration because it was one that was powerful in my life, and I use it for everything. Any addiction that God has delivered you from, he can deliver you from anything. And he can take, take the taste out your mouth. Did you hear what I said? I used to be a smoker. I smoked for years. Years. Cigarettes. I, I, got to smoke, I got to the point where I was smoking a pack and a half a day. There are 20 cigarettes in each pack. So a pack and a half, that's 30 cigarettes a day. And I wasn't even woke 24 hours a day. So I had to be smoking more than once an hour. Did you hear me? One day I was driving back to, I, I used to commute out here to see my wife. She wasn't my wife at the time, but it was going to happen. And I was commuting back to the Bay Area. And I was on the freeway, and my heart just, I mean, I got a pain in my heart just was it's indescribable. And so I, it was hurting so bad, I pulled over, and I lit a cigarette. <laughs> Finished smoking that cigarette, flicked it out, and I said, oh. Okay, now I'm going to make it now. Got back on the freeway. Not 10 minutes later, it came back. It, mm, it hurt me. This time when I pulled over, I threw the pack out the window. <laughs> and you can ask my wife. I called my wife and said, I'm not smoking no more. Praise the Lord. I, I called and told her that. I'm not smoking no more. It wasn't me. Because I, was been, I tried to quit before. I told her I wasn't smoking no more. And guess what? I never stopped touched the cigarette from that day on. Amen. The taste was taken from me. God took the taste out of my mouth so much so that now I can't stand the taste of cigarettes. Amen. Get this, saints of God. Every sin in your life is like that cigarette. God will take the taste out your mouth. He will make it repulsive to you. Whatever the sin is, whatever difficulty. Listen, don't let the devil hold nothing over your head because the Bible says if you confess your sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And get this, God is so good. He said, I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God is willing to make us whole. We don't have to be secret agents. Because the agents for God is out there in the open. Amen? For all to see. There's nothing secret about a Christian. We want to stand out far beyond anybody else. Saints of God, if you're struggling with something, if, you, if the devil's got something over your head, if you're thinking, oh, if they find out this about me, don't you worry about people. People can't save you. People don't have a heaven for you. People can't give you peace, joy. The fruits of the Spirit belong to God, and the only way you can get them is from Him. Whatever it is, whatever it is in your life, today is your day to let it go. No longer be an agent for the enemy because he don't love you. He can care less about you. Matter of fact, he wants you to die in your sin. But God wants to save you from your sin. He has something better for you. Amen. And, and, and God has. Oh, let me tell you. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. I can describe how good God is, but you need to taste for yourself. Amen. Saints of God, I implore you, taste and see. Try God. If you're going through something, if you're struggling with something, if something is still hanging on in your life, if something's hanging on to you so much so you can't let it go, ask God to take it away. And I promise you, God is faithful. He is faithful. He will take that thing from you. And once he takes it from you, you can walk in the newness of life. Amen. Saints of God, let me tell you, it is a joy to not be burdened down with sin. Amen. Now, don't get me wrong. I have, to, I have to ask for forgiveness every day. I know some of y'all ain't like that. But every day, something, something happens to where I have to ask for forgiveness. But here's the joy. When I ask for it, he gives it to me. He doesn't put any stipulations on it. God says, if you ask, I'll do it for you. I want to be like Jesus. How about you? Your opportunity is now if you bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, Lord, I told your people what you wanted me to tell them. Now, Father, I'm, I'm moving aside and putting it in your hands. Father, we're asking now for those who are serious about this thing, Lord, please beat back the enemy from our lives. Please help us to let go of that sin that so easily beset us. That sin that we can't seem to let go of, Lord, whatever it is, whether it's anger, adultery, fornication, whatever it is, Lord, cigarettes or Food, Father, please take it from us. Take it from us now. Father, when we came to church, we didn't want to stay here and hear your word and then leave the same way we came in. Father, change us now. Remove this burden from us, Lord. Please. Lord, we want to thank you because we're gonna, we know you're going to do it for those who are sincere. We know you're going to deliver us, Father, if we're sincere and serious with, about this thing, Lord. If we seriously confess it, you'll take it. So we're going to thank you. We're going to thank you, Father, for taking away the evil that is in us. Taking away the temptation that is ever before us. Taking away the desire, Father, to do wrong in your sight. Help us, Lord, to be more like Jesus. And Father, we'll be careful. Not to put it on ourselves like we've done some wonderful thing for ourselves. But we'll give you all the glory, the praise, and the honor. And we thank you over and over again. In Jesus' name, amen.